Welcome to Dodgers Dogs. Casey Porter joined by Coach Holt, as we are each and every Sunday, as we are smarting from the Oklahoma State beatdown they took from Texas yesterday, no doubt about that. We are super excited about all the stuff that's going on with the Dodgers, though, Coach. Lots of hot stove talk, lots of Gavin Lux talk, lots of, you know, uh, you know, just all of the trade market and, and, and Shohei Otani and Yamamoto. It's heating up that, you know, there's different teams in on those guys, so... Hey, how's it going, Coach? It's going great. Uh, like I said, licking our wounds with the old Longhorns laying the wood to us yesterday at Oklahoma State, that being. And uh, they got a heck of a team. Uh, glad to get back to uh, get get off that. That's such a big beating. You can get away from that pretty quick. That's an easy one to forget, Case. So we can get back to thinking about some good stuff, the old Dodgers, the hot stove stuff. And I want Otani and Yamamoto both. How about that? Is that, is that, is that possible? Can I get both I, of them? I think that's more than possible. I think it's likely the latest rumors are that that the, the Giants are in heavy and may even be the favorites for Yamamoto. You know, those kind of rumors when they come out, you're going to hear a million of those because yeah. it's all about leverage, Coach. You know how negotiations go. You've done a whole bunch of them in your life. What You, you know, you, you want to always have the, the upper hand in negotiations. So what you do is you start saying – you know what, I might go to the Giants. Then all of a sudden you say, especially the Giants, if you actually want to go to the Dodgers, yep. what team to use better than the Giants for leverage against the Dodgers, right? That's right. I mean, uh, of course, nowadays you could use uh, maybe the Astros. You know, there's a lot of Dodger fans have some hard feelings towards the Astros. That'd really get your blood boiling, you know, if you're something about the Astros or uh, maybe the Padres. I think we've kind of handled the Padres pretty well though, outside of the series in our life, and we won't bring up again. <laughs> yeah so uh the 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 hot stove talk coach obviously Yamamoto we've talked several different times would be the number one starter that you're looking for and then Otani he would be the superstar that would make fans happy and you know provide a, a lot of dynamic offense for this group and then hopefully after he gets over his Tommy John surgery he could come back and then that would give you a one and a two. So let me ask you this: as I'm going to set some of your audio levels as you talk here. I've, I've put some new compression into these things, so I'm kind of doing this audio as we go. So, what are your, you know, do you think the Dodgers, if they went and got, if they went and got Otani, and then they got Yamamoto, that gives them one pitcher for next year? Do you think they need another one for the back end? Uh, yeah, I think I'd like to see them get another one. Uh, of course, I'd love to have, like I said, I'd love to have both of them. I mean, Moto, it gives you a number one, and, uh, you know, Otani, as we know, is not going to pitch next year. I was kind of su surprised that he was still around the 500 million mark with, you know, I guess they're, everybody's pretty sure the way Tommy John surgeries are now, uh, that, uh, that he'll be back full bore after next year, taking a year off from throwing. So I guess it's kind of a guarantee that you're going to get that another starter. So you get starter one A and one B. So that that'd be a great thing. But yeah, I'd, I still like to see him pick up another one. Of course, they may not have any money left. I hate saying that the Dodgers are always going to have money. They're like the Yankees and their Dallas Cowboys and all that. They're never going to run out of money. But you know, and I know we're here in the now. And uh, I noticed we signed Joe Kelly yesterday. That's good. That that tells you like what we've always talked about on the show. And everybody talks about, you know, there, there's no such thing as rebuilding for the Dodgers. You know, they're, 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 they're playing to win now. And, and I know you feel the same way I do. I love Joe Kelly's attitude. You know, he has his moments, but I mean, he brings an attitude to the mound of I am, I don't care who it is. I'm not backing down. And, and that's a good guy to have on your ball club. Normally he comes out of the pen, he's ready to go. But so I was kind of glad to see, see him get him back. But I know how you and I both feel, especially you, because you have a personal connection with these young, young people that you interview and, know some of them personally of our, our Dodger great prospects. So, you know, there, there's a fine line there going going hardcore with it, getting the older guys back. Yeah. Still got those great young ones sitting out there. But if you can get these two guys we're talking about, Otani, Yamamoto, uh, holy cow, you know, let's go. Let's tee it up tomorrow and start playing. Yeah, no doubt. The, the, you know, there's the, it's a fun time of year because the winter meetings and all the hot stove talk, all the rumors. Of course, you and I don't get as much into the rumors because, you know, you kind of have – you kind of have an idea of what's going to happen and what the club needs. And and you, you've learned just kind of put the, the trust in the organization to fill the needs with whatever guys they may be. And so from my perspective, it's not like I need to know about every second of the details that are happening in the winter meetings because the Dodgers know the – and I've made my – you know, the last show I made my my feelings really well felt as far as getting these prospects to the major league level – you know, at a, in a t 
time and period of their career where they can still have productive major league careers. Having said that, this organization, I have total faith that every time they go into these situations, they know what they need the most. They know how to negotiate, and they always come out with it, even if it's like a Ryan Yarbrough or Ryan Brazier or somebody that it might be like that. Now, do, are they perfect? Do they get it right every time? Were they right with Cindergard? No. Were they right necessarily with Lance? Nobody gets it right every time. So, for me, yes, it's exciting. We've talked about it quite a bit. But I think you and I probably have a little bit different perspective in the sense that we just kind of have a little bit more trust and we don't need to know about it every second of the day. No, I agree with that. And, and you can even say the Rangers got it wrong. You know, they, they got a couple of things that didn't pan out for them, yet they're still the World Series champs. So there's a fine line, uh, these organizations are making the right moves. It's obvious the Rangers made the right moves. Their guys got, you know, playing well at the right time, that sort of thing. So, you know, there, there's no guarantees in anything. Life, as we know, I don't have to talk, tell anybody about that stuff. We all we all understand that. And the moves you make, uh, I, I'm like you. I don't have to sit around and know every day. I'm a Dallas Cowboy fan, as we've talked about, and I, I can't remember if you are or not, but I, I know there's a lot of Cowboy haters out there. Well, I'm a Cowboy lover, and I get tired of every offseason. The Cowboy, I, I pick up, get on the Internet or social media, and the Cowboys may do this. The Cowboys may get some, and I saw one of them, and they never do any of that stuff. I'm just like, somebody's throwing it out there or whatever. Everybody's hopeful. And I saw some of the things today, like the Dodgers, they may get, you know, like, so it kind of turned me off a little bit. It's not, I'm not blaming anybody in particular, just I'm speaking as a fan. It gets clicks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need to know. Yes, it gets clicks. And they know I'm looking at it, reading it. You know, Dodger, I see this stuff on the Facebook. I love our Dodger people, though, by the yes. way, you guys. I'm not stepping anybody's toe. All the all you Dodger folks out there, with your with your information, I'm all over you. So I, I love what you do. So, but I, I I don't I'm like you. I don't need to know everything. Just uh, when it happens, it happens, and uh, I don't care who they run out there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna love the Dodgers no matter what. I've got an opinion like everybody else, but I'm not holding the checkbook, and I'm not having any power whatsoever, other than being a guy who really cares. We are already have a great crowd. Roy Estrada has joined, and we're going to talk about Gavin Lux. He's already given his opinion on Lux. We'll get to that here in a minute. Craig Ostenberg, he is one of our Osterberg, one of our great uh, Dodgers Daily fans that comes on almost every time. He won't be here tonight. He's got to go to dinner. Sunday nights are kind of difficult, but hey, we throw out different nights of the week because different people can can hit different days of the week. So hey, I would love for this to be led by the by the lobby, and let's go whichever way you'd like to go. But we are going to talk about one thing we do know is that the Dodgers are not going to get another shortstop. And I know a lot of Dodgers fans are worried about that. They saw Miguel Rojas last year. They're not exactly sure of Gavin. They've seen Gavin Lux at second base, a little bit of shortstop, so they're worried about that. Does that worry you, Coach? As a little bit. It's just the unknown. It goes back to what we just said earlier, Case. We all, we all love Gavin Lux. We know what he showed in the minor leagues, and, and the Dodgers certainly had the trust in him last year, and he was already named the starting shortstop, you know, and going into spring training. So I trust the Dodgers, they, the brass, the people that, that, that deal with these guys every day that are certainly a lot smarter than I am that they know what they got in Gavin Lux. But, yes, as a fan sitting out here in Stillwater, Oklahoma, I have some concerns, you know, about, about what's going there. Of course, you know how I feel. I, I want to keep Trey Turner. If we're going to keep Trey Turner, I, I want Dansby Swanson. We didn't get either one of them. So, uh, that was at that point. So, that, that that was where I was at on that. But that ship's already sailed. That's moved, we're moved on. And, and the Dodgers believe Gavin Lux was going to be their shortstop last year. And they certainly know more about it than I do. And, and we can just all hope for the best right here. And, and and again, there's no a guarantee on anything, and uh, you know I'm I'm all in on the, if that's how they feel on him. Let's get right to it, Coach. I'm going to go ahead and change this over so you can see it. I'm I'm going to play Gavin Lux right now, defensively at shortstop. Let me back this up just for a second. I'm going to cut it over and then start playing. You don't see it yet, there, Coach. I'm going to get that to you here in just a second, and then we'll get to talking about Gavin Lux. Right there. You ought to be able to see it here. And let me turn on my virtual camera. You ought to be able to see it now, Coach Holt, correct? Yes, I got you. Okay, so this is Gavin Lux. Lots of video that most people, probably I'm the only one who does have here on Dodgers Daily. I saw Gavin Lux a lot at Tulsa. I saw Gavin Lux a lot at Oklahoma City. And I can tell you in 2019, if the Dodgers would have turned over the shortstop position in 2020 to Gavin Lux, 
Dodgers fans would have been super pumped about it. The problem is, and I've actually communicated with Gavin about this, and one of the comments that, that a lot of these guys make is, I don't think people understand how difficult it is to change positions and do so having to learn a new position at the major league level. It is an extremely difficult deal, especially when you're talking about completely flipping angles. You're talking about moving away from first base instead of towards it. And so really the Gavin Lux that I've seen at second base is quite a bit less confident than the Gavin Lux that I saw for three years, basically, while he's in the Dodgers system growing up at shortstop. I just think he's a natural shortstop. I think his footwork's better. I think that makes his arm that much better. And his confidence level just goes through the roof. Now, the problem that you might have, the concern you might have is with the, the ACL deal, is he going to have a lateral movement? I can say nobody's going to know that. I would, I would imagine, hey, we know ACLs, guys come back from them all the time. But I can tell you he does have the arm because the footwork's different from shortstop than it is second. What do you see here from what you're seeing, Coach? Just watching the videos you're talking there, Case. I mean, this is, speaks you know volumes to me right now because we're in the middle of getting our uh, Stillwater Pioneer baseball team ready for the season. So this is the highest level of baseball in Stillwater High in, a, in Oklahoma High School, which you've coached on that level too. Uh, that's stuff we talk about our infielders with, you know, the different angles, you know, uh, the difference in the position just on the high school level, even mm -hmm. second base, shortstop, third base, wherever you're playing. They're, they're, we we work with different footwork on that. I, I understand what you're talking about. He looks pretty na pretty natural watching these videos over and over of him playing shortstop. It's funny sometimes he comes over the top with it, but he but he can defend on the position of his body. We talk about you know direction. We we do drills where we have cones set up so our kids their footwork you know step and they're getting around the baseball and feel the ball and we have them the direction of first base. We do that drill from shortstop, much like what what you see here uh, on on a smaller level, but really. It's fundamental baseball, and he, and he feels the ball. And he gets up over the top. Like I said, a lot of times he comes over the top, but he did show the turn to double play. He can drop down and do what he's got to do to get his arm at the proper angle or field on the run like he did right there. So he looks totally uh, uh, comfortable playing shortstop. And uh, like I said, people a lot smarter than me think he, he's a major league shortstop, and I'm all in for those guys. Let me back that up, Coach. Well, this is kind of what I'm talking about. We're going to actually get kind of technical. Here. See how he comes into his left here. Now, this is what yeah. I'm talking about. If he's a second baseman here, his angle is going away from first base. Yep. So that means he has to gather his feet. He has to throw across his body and come back to first base. Now, what I want you to to watch here, your last, you know, your your last three steps should be your last four steps actually. Right, left field, right, left throw. And Absolutely. you should shuffle to get the big hop right before you get into that. Now, watch yeah. this footwork. Watch him. See how he shuffles? See how he just yeah. shuffled right there? Now, right, left, right, left, throw. That is just absolutely textbook. I want to back that up one more time. Yeah. Watch how he gloves, shuffles to gloves. get into his footwork. Yeah. The shuffle yeah. right there. See that shuffle? And then right, left, right, left, throw. That right there is why he's much better at shortstop than he is at second base. No, right left field, right left field. You're absolutely correct. And the way he's showing his glove, you know, a lot of kids have their gloves setting up. As we said, you're going to catch nothing but raindrops in the point in the sky. He's got his glove pointed down in the proper position right there. You can tell the guy's spent a lot of time, been worked with a lot, and just pure athletic ability. We're, we're talking about a major league shortstop for obvious reasons. But, yeah, I can see exactly what you say there. Right left field, right left throw. We've done it forever. Uh, I think Coach Lee's actually calls it something else, but it's the same thing. It's right left field, right left throw. But and working on direction to the depending on where you feel the baseball at, working on your footwork and your direction. And uh, hey, I see the May out. So here, you, here you said show the glove. See that right there. That's what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Where the glove, he's showing the glove right there. He don't have it where it's laying on the ground. Where it's, you know, he's got he's got his he's got his fingers pointing down. In other words, he's got the fingers going down, and he gets ready to field it. So there's the right. There's the left. See that? Yep. There's the field. Now watch the next step. It's going to be the right foot. See that? And then left foot throw. And yep. right here, he is just absolutely in perfect position. So anything going to his left, he's as smooth as any shortstop that you will watch. So here's the one coming in. See how now I want you, I, here's another one. Okay. Now this is an eight, coach. This this takes this shows you that how just how comfortable he is at short. This next play, we're going to get past this one. Then we're going to keep going. I think I just actually got paused up right there. Let me let me start that again, Coach. I think my uh, program just uh, 
it just uh, froze up on me. But I want to get back to that because I know you'll have a great opinion on this. Okay, see how you come. Well, that's not the that's not the same one. But let's get back to where we were before. Okay, right here, coming in. Okay, so yeah. this is an eight, and what I mean by that is a lot of shortstop. If you haven't played shortstop a lot, you're coming in on a ball right here. First of all, what's going to happen? You've heard your coach since the time you're in T-ball, charge the ball, charge the ball, charge the ball, right? Well, a lot of times guys will just run in the ball and work themselves into a really bad hop. So the two hops you want, you either want that big candy hop that everybody can field, or you want to attack the ball and get that what's called a short hop. So watch how Gavin Lux attacks that ball. See the hop he got right there? Okay, and the next thing that I want people to notice about what he did, how he worked himself into a good hop right there. He worked himself into a short hop. At this point, what less experienced shortstops would do is they'll think, well, that was a slow roller. I've got to hurry. Instead, Gavin just has that innate feeling about what the runner is. He gets himself underneath him. Look how effortless that. I'm going to back that up, Coach. Look, I mean, this is on the run, and this is moving towards home plate. Watch how effortless that throw is. And very comfortable, yeah, very comfortable in that throw. What he's doing, like you said, he didn't attack too much where he overran the ball or put himself in a bad position. He had his footwork down. He, he came in and, like I said, got the, got the ball up quick and got it away. But it, you can tell the guy's played a lot of shortstop. You know, he, he knows what he's doing there. I make one high throw. Everybody does that. It doesn't sure. matter. But a uh, good position there. But, yeah, coming in on the ball is – it's not, yeah, like you said, Case, we, we do drill after drill like you did with your kids there at Guthrie. The short hop, you know, that's – you want to get the good hop. You know, the sh- we work on – everything is short hop drill. You know, short hop, you know, you said we had to get them down their knees, coach on the knees, either with a fun go or throwing the ball, hit, hit the short hop drill. It's like they do with the big leaders. I love watching Ron Washington videos of doing that stuff. There's a lot of videos of him out there working with the infielders with the Braves and the Rangers whenever he did that. And that's the type of stuff they work on. That's the type of stuff all these big leaders work on. And minor leaguers are all trying to get to the same level. So mm-hmm. he's he's well trained in, in his craft right there and looks very comfortable playing shortstop. Let me say another thing here, coach. And this is something also that has been trained into him that, that, that you don't have to worry about. You mentioned that he does sometimes come back up to the top, which means that it takes time to get rid of the ball if you do that, yep. versus you like to throw the ball from the angle that you catch it from. So if you catch it waist high, throw it somewhere waist high. If you catch it shoulder high, throw it shoulder high. If you catch it down below, you're going to throw it from a little bit lower angle. So if you catch the ball down around your feet and then bring it all the way up above your head, that takes time, and a lot of times you don't have time. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah, and he usually does that on a root, quote unquote routine play. You know, for me, there's nothing routine, but for him, it's a routine play. He comes in, he feels it cleanly. That's how he gets his feet, you know, right, left field, right, comes up, gets his feet set, and just comes. That's probably his natural throwing angle ever since his little bitty kid and he started playing mm-hmm. a little bit over top. And if there's been some infield instructor somewhere, you know, that's got him understanding there's a time to place, you know, that he won't be able to come. He, come over the top like an outfielder would. That's more of an outfield throw. But I'm not, not saying a bad thing. Like I said, this guy's a major league shortstop. He, he just, he's just coming up nice and easy throws over the top. With he's got time with it. But you can see him some plays around the bag. And when he come in on the ball, he he's, he's he does a very good job with his footwork and his hands and get, getting rid of the ball. And he's certainly got a good arm. So watch the separation here. From the time he fields, Coach, watch how fast he separates. See that? that yep. that's That's very impressive. Right there. I mean, that's a very seamless, very impressive transition from field to slot, right? And here's the slot, Coach. See how he came up to the shoulders right there? That's not bad. I mean, that's kind of what you're talking about. He didn't – on that one, he didn't go all the way over his head. He did come up a little bit. I do think that's something he's probably going to have to adjust a little bit from AAA maybe to major leagues. But I think it's also something that if you know the scouting report, you know who the runners are. You can do it to some runners and not others. And – not every player in the major leagues is a guy that's running sub four to first base. <laughs> no, no. Right. He just stay, stand within his fundamentals of fielding the baseball. Like I said, come up, get good separation, pulling his glove away as, as he prepares to throw the ball. So good stuff. Yeah. See, I, I'm going to disagree with anybody who says Gavin Lux doesn't have major league skills at shortstop. This, again, we're talking about short windows. When you, when you put a guy in, in a short window at a position he hadn't played in a while, it's a very difficult situation. I have seen Gavin Lux a whole bunch of times at shortstop. There's a good play right there. Yep. He absolutely yeah, has. And look down. how he hits the bag there, comes yep. across. I will disagree with anybody that does not think he doesn't have major league skills to be a shortstop. I totally agree. And like I said, I, me and you are sitting there watching video. And, Here's a double play. And, See how, how quick he gets yep. rid of it? 
that, that of course nowadays with replay, down, that might sure. not actually there's a good there's a good uh there's a good turn there for him by himself and then here's one from the pitcher which is a tough one because you have the the runner bearing down it right there that yeah. that's a pretty good that's a that's a pretty tough play because the runner's bearing down but a good transition from footwork to glove so that they, we're going to roll through some more of these but that's gavin lux's shortstop a little bit of him but again i you know i We'll see. I mean, the good thing about this is the Dodgers do have Miguel Rojas. If it doesn't work, I can yep. assure you there's people that are smarter than me that have been that have been sold on the fact that Gavin Lux is going to be a major league shortstop since about 2017, right? Yep. That's Absolutely. a long time. And I promise you, if he wasn't on the Dodgers, he'd be somewhere else, and he'd be probably an all-star shortstop somewhere else too. So there's that one that you talk about coming yeah, back over the top. top. Yeah, you what you what are your big, biggest concerns that you see here, Coach? You got a big 250 foot. You can tell the guy was running around. Not that guy, the guy before there, the big, huge guy. He knew what kind of runner he had. That's the only reason he's doing it. He, that's probably his, somewhat of his natural throw motion, a little bit more over the top, you know. Of course, I used to get all ticked off because I'm an old grouchy guy. You know, when they, when they yeah. drop down, throw it in the dugout over there. Of course, I used to say, when you guys get the big leagues, you can do that. But right now, you're in high school. So, quit, you know. But anyway, everybody's got their own thing. But he's probably just got probably a little bit more of his natural throwing motion coming over the top. And he, he did it. If you watch him here, he didn't do it because he probably right. had a little bit faster runner. Uh, yeah, probably had a guy you knew you had to get rid of. So, I don't have any concerns with that. And, you know, he's just out playing catch. Again, yeah. people smarter than me have watched him take a lot of ground balls and throw it. They're, they're not concerned with it either. Are the skills there though? Is the arm good enough from what you oh, see? Oh yeah, I don't think I don't think there's any doubt about it. The I mean, footwork can, good enough? Tell. Yes. Yeah. I mean that, that's, that hand right there. Look at that. I mean, you see how he did get around the bag? He, he understands. He still gets his body in position to throw after he, after he has a tough picker like here. He's still in a good position to throw the ball. He doesn't have to throw it. Of course, big league shortstops can throw it from about every angle, like I used, like I just said a while ago. Like my high school kids can. I tell them, don't do that because you're not good enough to do that. Not a multi-million dollar short shot sure. yet, but these guys can can pull it off. So let me ask you this, Coach. You've seen a lot of them at second base, right? That's what most Dodgers fans have seen. You saw him the short of limited amount of time that he had at shortstop as well that he's played at the major league level. Does he look more natural at shortstop to you than he does second base? Yes. And, and hey, if you more, don't think so, please, I don't want to talk you into it. I, no, no, he looks more natural to me. Like he looks like he's spent most of his time at shortstop. You know more about that than I do. What his what his history is, but uh, he he looks pretty pretty natural right there at shortstop. Let's get into some comments. Grizz Monster, good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Grizz. Orlando, excellent. Hello, Dodgers dogs. Good evening, Orlando. Grizz, latest is the Giants will not be outbid for Otani or Yamamoto. That doesn't surprise me. That's kind of what we're talking about. If you're Yamamoto, though, you throw all those rumors out there, especially the Dodgers rivals, and and you up the price, right? And and you make people have to outbid to get you. That only makes your contract that much bigger. After offering the most for Judge and Correa, I don't doubt it. Ela Shiva, good evening. Joe Kelly is a total stud. I think I know what's up. Casey, what's up? I think I knew. Thank you for joining tonight. Scott Strong report Red Sox aren't interested in trading for Corbin Burns. That's one less suitor to compete with the Dodgers for the rental ace. Coach, we're not going to get too much into this because I spoke way too long on it the other night, but – Am I right in saying that if you can go get a Corbin Burns when you have seven or eight 25-year-old major league-ready prospects right now, especially on the pitching side, do you dump all of them to go get a Corbin Burns? That I think I, you do. I think you have to. If you get if you get a top well, – like we talked about the last time we were on here, if you, if you get a top-line starter now, you're going to have to get – we can't – like you said, Casey, there's several reasons you can't sit there and hold these young kids yes. back. You know, you you have a personal relationship with some of them, and it, you like the guys, and you know them personally. You don't want them buried in Oklahoma City or Tulsa when they can be playing on a major league level. So that's one angle of it. The other angle of it is, you know, the, the, the business side of it is they're worth something. That They're very valuable for, for the teams, whichever's involved in it. They're very valuable there. For those young men, you want to see them get to what their goal has been ever since they've been a little bit of kid and that's get to the major league. So, yeah, I think if you can get a top-line starter uh, and, and you're, you're going to have to get rid of some of those guys, you, you got to do it. I mean, I, I you hold on to them forever. Yeah. You know, we know what potential is. It just means you hadn't done you know what. <laughs> Some right. coach used another word for it, but it just means you haven't done anything yet. That's what potential is. And 
and that's what you have. So, and, and there's no guarantee on any of those guys either making it up sure. there. So, though we do know, and we've already seen because they were thrown under. Again, the thing that impressed me about them so much, and I've told you several times, these guys were brought in when this was a pitting race last year. Sure. This wasn't a 14 game lead when these guys were called up to pitch because everybody went out. Everybody got hurt. You know, Kershaw's hurt. I mean, our whole starting rotation's gone. That's still the most impressive thing I've seen on Major League level. I know and to win 100 games. That's what number one is. And you win 100 games, win your division by 14 games. It's it's nuts. So those guys, when well, they came in to pitch from Tulsa, come from Oklahoma City and Tulsa and come up and have to throw, they're throwing in a pitter race. And that's even more impressive. They didn't come up there with a 14-game lead and just try to work on some things, you know, and, and get hammered. And the coach tells them, hey, don't do that again, do this. They, they had to pitch under fire. And that, that's – that's kind of, to me that kind of moves you into the front of the class as far as the potential angle of it. They, they yeah. put a, a lot of these guys, Pepe and those guys, and Sheehan, all those guys, Gavin Stone. You know, Miller's already established himself, but uh, they they were under fire in, in, in a big time situation. And it's not like well, we think they can do it. Well, I mean, we don't. The playoffs that we talked about is a whole different deal. Miller got killed the playoffs, but we know he's an outstanding pitcher. You don't judge him on that. It's like you don't judge Kershaw on his playoff deal there, but. You know, there's no guarantee on any of that stuff. But they, these guys have proven they can pitch at the major league level mm-hmm. and be successful. So, and they're with a great organization that's going to put a good team behind them. So, I, you know, it's 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 you got to get rid of some of them. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Uh, it's a win-win. Whenever yeah. you trade, it's a win-win. These players go and they get a chance to become the major leaguer coach. And I use the word chance. That's all anybody can ask for. Yep. And when I say chance, I mean a real chance, not. Hey, we're going to fly you from Oklahoma City to L.A., give you three games and nine at-bats, and if you don't get two hits, we're sending – that's not a real chance, you know, and we're going to do that seven times throughout the year. Yeah. That's not a, a chance. Coffee. We call that a cup of coffee. You get Correct. a cup of coffee at the big league level. That's not what we're talking about. You're right. Correct. A real chance. So it's a win-win. Trade situations are a win-win because the players get put in a situation to where they have a real chance to become the major leaguer that they're capable of. If they don't take advantage of their chance like Miguel Vargas did, hey, you had your shot, brother. This is a the, – the, the sad part of the business part of this is when you get your chance, if you don't take your real chance, not, you know, like I said, right. not the cup of coffee. If you don't take advantage of it, then you might get another chance and you might not, Coach. That, yeah, that's, you know, so if you're Miguel Vargas right now, you probably are going to get another chance, but, hey, there's nothing to say you will either, right? No, you don't guarantee at all. Like I said uh, – you, you had that opportunity, and I, I don't think he blew anything. He didn't blow it. You know, he didn't ruin anything, but, you know, you still go get that opportunity. But, you know, Lux comes back healthy, and I'm assuming he, you know, the way, the way surgeries are nowadays, Case, and back in the old days, old as I, we all know, you know, if you had ACL surgeries back when Mickey Mantle played, he'd have probably hit 800 home runs and played till his age 45 because he was that talented. You know, he, he runs his knee one time, and it – Fixing the rest of his career, he'd probably be able to hit 300 home runs there if he tore his knee up. But right. the, the surgeries, the Tommy John, all these surgeries nowadays are so sophisticated and so successful. You know, ACLs. He'll come back, yeah, he'll come back out, out there with uh, that ACL surgery. You'll probably sometimes even better than you were before. So yeah. I don't have any doubt about his capabilities there. I, I think it's obvious. The Dodgers haven't made a move yet. They, they have no doubts whatsoever. They've seen him. They've worked with him. They're, mm-hmm. they're right on top of all that. If they had any concerns about his knee, we'd already be talking about a new yeah. shortstop coming in. We would. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. And, Roy, you are 100% correct here at the, the fact that the Dodgers, they love mentorship. They love mentorship, Coach. That's why they have Henny at the AA level. It's why they have Travis at the AAA level. It's why they brought Daniel Nava in to be the high A coach. That's why John Shoemaker – is the single A coach at Rancho, and he's the first coach these guys get to play for, for an affiliated team. He's a legend, coach. I mean, yep. John Shoemaker is a Dodger legend. Travis Barbary is, I think, fifty three years old. The AAA manager. The Dodgers are his only job, coach. He's never had another job. He's been with the Dodgers for like thirty years, and we we know Henny. I mean, Henny's a huge mentor, coach. Yep. They will all tell you that the Dodgers are huge on mentorship. Roy, you have this. 100% correct. The reason why this is going to have the best chance possible for Gavin Lux to work at shortstop is because he has Miggy Rowe right behind him. Miggy Rowe is not going to be competing with him. Miggy Rowe is going to be mentoring him. 
Miggy Rowe is going to be mentoring him on being the Dodgers shortstop for the next six, seven, eight years. And boy, Miggy Rowe, he's a hell of a mentor, man. I, I love Miggy Rowe from that perspective. I think it's a great situation. That's good for him. He's going to get, and he'll get to play whenever he can, too. It's not one of those things. Sure. They're not going to forget about him. You know, I, I go back to, I remember, when, you know, just the short period of time that the Dodgers had Greg Maddox in their dugout. Everybody just raved about the, the value the value of that. Not just talking to pitchers, but talking to hitters. Watch this guy. He can sit there and pick apart the other team's pitchers and tell the hitters, you know, what to look for. Uh, you, there's no no price tag on that. I wish they'd go give him how much money, get him out of his house there in Vegas to come be to set the dugout. But, you know, Greg Max, he probably enjoys his retirement, look, you know, playing on the golf course and stuff. But, uh, you know, but I'll go back to that one. That, that was just a guy in the dugout, you know. It, yeah. It was just – the wealth of knowledge and of, of baseball for everybody. You know, he's not, he, yeah, he's a Hall of Fame pitcher, but he he understood the hitting and what they were trying to do to get hitters out. And he could help he helped the Dodgers hitters at the same time. So, yeah, mentor anything you can have in there. A guy can help you uh, uh, fine tune your craft. It, it's invaluable, and, and all these teams want it. Everybody wants it, mm -hmm. and, and probably a lot of them have it. But I promise you, just like you said, Case, everybody wants it. Coach, can you see the, the video here? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is Austin Gothier. You're going to love this guy, Coach. I'm going to go over some numbers. One of the questions here, or one of the comments, was from Philip. Philip, thank you so much for joining. We need a shortstop prospect who can hit and field. Who is the most ready to make the major league club? The next guy up, the AAA shortstop was Yanni Hernandez. The Dodgers got rid of, I believe he became a free agent. So did Bryson Brigman, who is the other guy that played the the bulk of the shortstop for AAA Oklahoma City. Luke Williams was a shortstop early in the season. The Dodgers brought him up, DFA'd him. So Luke Williams wasn't with the club for like the last half of last year. So the ne And then also, Luis Diaz became a free agent. He played a lot of shortstop. Mm -hmm. The year before that, Lionel Valera, I'm going to roll through some more video of him. So if this kind of seems awkward or chunky, please please right. forgive me on this. I'm going to continue to roll through some, some different videos of Austin Gothier. So the next guy in line, Coach, is Austin Gothier. And this dude is awesome, okay? He comes from the Virginia area, went to Hostra, and he's not very big. If you look at his exit velos, wow. nothing about him when you watch him play is going to make a scout go, wow, look at that dude, right? He's the right. type of guy, Coach, he's your type of guy that you need to see him for 162 games to appreciate just how good he is. Does he profile as a shortstop? He played a lot of it last year, especially after the Dodgers – DFA'd Eddie, Eddie's Leonard. You know, I think Eddie's Leonard was probably him and Yorbit Vivas. They came up in the organization together. They got put on the 40 man roster together. I think Eddie's probably was going to be the next shortstop the Dodgers were going to look at until they DFA'd him. Then it became Luis Diaz and Austin Gothier playing shortstop. Luis Diaz no longer with the organization. So now the next guy in line is Austin Gothier, coach. And I'm going to go over some statistics here if i can get to them i had them up just a second ago give me just a second because okay. they are super super impressive so tell me first of all from what you see on the video tell me what you see from him as far as just the mechanics and some of the things that you see from him well i like the way he sets up you know as far as the hitter you know he starts his hands high but you can tell he's getting back down getting a slot getting a good load there of course i like the fact he don't have any trouble sticking that elbow out there either trying yeah. to get on base and <laughs> So that's I, he, he, not seeing him as much as you have. He comes across to me as a, as, a, as we used to call him the old dirt daubers. Yes, you know, absolutely. Whatever I, got to do, whatever I got to do to win the game, I'll be out here. I'll take a uh, thousand ground balls after the game, coach. You'll hit me some. You know, he, he just seems to be that guy. And 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 you can't ever have enough of those. I know we we've got there's several of the big leagues right now, and a lot of guys are, are those guys. You know, gym rats, dirt daubers, whatever you want to call them. Those guys that. that they do everything they can to be successful. Okay, so some numbers on Austin Gothier, Coach. Right here. First of all, he hit 293, which is incredible. He hit 365. Actually, at the high level, he hit 365. Got moved to double-A Tulsa, and a lot of people will tell you that jump from high-A to double-A is the toughest one. He hit 293 with Tulsa. He had an on-base percentage. On-base percentage a 411 okay ops 844 so yes the exit velo numbers aren't elite but the ops is over 800 
for a guy who hit 293, and that's not the best part of what he does, okay? He had a WRC plus of 129, which which is really, really, really good. So to get to some more of his numbers, this is what you're really going to like if I can get down to it. His K percentage, Coach, at the AA level, at the AA level went down from the high A level. His K percentage was 16% with Great Lakes. Then when he got moved up to AA Tulsa, it went down to 13.8%. So his, his, his strikeout rate was 13.8%. His walk rate was 163 So he had a 2.5% higher walk rate than he did a strikeout rate to go with the 844 OPS and the 293 average. So I think if you had to, to you know, if you have to say who is the, the next guy that's closest – I know it's not, you know, he's a guy that doesn't have the six foot five frame and, and he's not going to hit the 30 home runs. But Austin Gothier, if you watch him day in and day out, you can just see it from here, coach. He is awesome to watch. But you can tell, I like to right here, he's getting ready to punch that first base coach in the chest. You like a guy like that. You already tell the coach said something, the coach is relaying something to him. He's going to get a little short pot in the chest. You can tell he's a guy that loves the game, way he plays the game, way he approaches the game. Uh, there's a reason why, you know, again, it goes back to smarter people than me that, that deal with this every day. They wake up in the morning, they're all about Dodger baseball, which would be a great job, by the way, Casey, if we could ever figure out a way to get them one of those. But So they're they're studying all this, and for them to, to, to make the moves they did, let people go, do what, and, and this guy's the next one, that tells you right there what the organization thinks of him, and that's, that's good enough for me. And the, the strikeout, oh, that, that's great. I mean uh, – and double A is a t- as we've talked about. It's before, tough. That's a cl- that's close to the major league level. Every time I go into Tulsa, watch a game a while from my brother in laws, and uh, there, there's guys come blowing it. I mean, there's there's good looking pitchers and players in, in the double in that Texas league. You know, that's one we have capability of seeing. So that's pretty impressive for him to have a lower strikeout rate when he gets to the double A level because there's some dead gum arms running out at him out there. Well, the Tulsa two years ago that they had the highest average pitch average pitch the Tulsa drillers average pitch was 94.4 miles an hour yeah man I mean that's there's no I mean that's that's more than what most major league clubs do because most major league clubs will have a crafty lefty here you know they'll have a matchup guy there here's another thing about Gothier coach you've noticed one thing and I know you love this because you worked on with me and I and and it really helped me is the way that he's able to stay inside the ball and go the other way with it it's oppo percentage Last year was 33.3%, which was only a, a percentage and a half lower than his pull percentage. And his center position uh, per, uh, per percentage, meaning the time, amount of time that he goes up the middle with the ball, is 31.7. So when you combine his oppo and middle percentage, that is six, that's 60, that's 66% compared to the 35% that he pulls the ball. So he goes up the middle, opposite field, two times out of three versus pulling the ball, which to me, that translates to major league success. Well, every one of these hits right here you're seeing are off of, and there's only one of them, one of them is actually kind of inside pitch. He's yes. still hit the right field. The others are two middle. Strikes. You know, middle, he, he's hitting them away. That, that, there's an arch that, well, he rolled over one. I guess I'll shut up here. He'll probably beat it up. But, you know, we always work on hitters, but, you know, you get fooled once in a while. That does happen where you will roll over one. For the most part, he keeps his hands inside the ball. And, and, and directional, you know, like we even work with our high school hitters, you know, on direction. We try to hit everything uh, straight down the middle of the cage. Even when we're in the batting tunnel, everything, we want it straight ahead and roll it into the side of the cage and get out of the cage. You're, you're wasting your time. That's not going to work. So I know the major league guys are doing the same thing. I've sat and watched Matt Holiday take BP in the, in the tunnel and everything hit off the back of it. And, and uh, his sons are the same way. So I know that what the training comes in. He, this guy's getting inside. See, that ball's up a little bit right there. He, Look he what he did with it. it. Hits it out of the ballpark. But he, but he had a good swing on it. You know, Either way, he had a good swing. He got on top of it and was able to get it out. So, there, there, I said, there's a reason why the Dodgers have put so much stock in him. Uh, they're sold on him. I'll put it that way. So, let me ask you this, Coach. With two strikes, you know, the, there's not really an approach anymore. There's It's more, hey, two strikes, try to hit the ball the other way. That's pretty much your approach. You know, yeah. 30 years ago, maybe you told a guy spread out, you know, maybe yeah. raise your – whatever. But the guys yeah. don't do that nowadays. So, basically, the two-strike approach is maybe a little get a little deeper, 
go the other way with it. So with two strikes, you've called a lot of pitches in your day. Where do you right here? Where's that pitch? Where do you try to tell your pitchers to locate the ball with two strikes? Well, we, we always tell our hitters to look away. Of course, you know? of course. So if I can come inside, that's obviously going to be the opposite of what we what we got our hitters looking for. You know, they're obviously going to look away. You know, the old two strike approach. I know that it's a. I sit there and watch major league games, whether it's the Dodgers or anybody else, and then they're going. You know, nobody has a two strike approach and look at what the old guys like old guys like me used to teach, but. You want to get them, you're, they're going to be looking away. Usually somebody with a two-strike, especially at the high school level, are going to be throwing something you know, away, probably the big league level. I mean, but they're, they're, they don't hide a whole lot of pitches to the big league. So uh, that's probably why they don't have a whole lot of two-strike approach. A guy's throwing 98, 99, he ain't worried about going outside when he's trying to blow mm-hmm. you away. So you won't get a whole lot of that there. Yeah, so if you can hit an outside pitch with two strikes, to me, if you can hit outside pitches the other way, that's going to allow you to hit – at all in all counts you're going to be yeah. a good two-strike hitter and also coach there's nothing more frustrating than if if you bust a guy in and he just pulls his hands inside and inside out inside out outs one to right field that's frustrating and yeah. you saw it you mentioned just a minute ago gothier can do that yeah we got a guy at second base nobody out we teach our hitters that you know hit the hit the ball behind the runner you know you're, you're trying to get him to third base with you know with no slider, coach. One. watch watch him hit that slider watch that see that yeah that's big time man he handles a bat very well right there. You're trying to get him to hit, hit the ball the other way, get, get, by, get move runners over. No, that's not a big thing on the big league level, but it is if you want to win. You know, you're going to try to move runners around, and, and they're going to hit, hit the ball the other way, stay inside the baseball. We called – this is from Grizz Monster. Grizz is one of our best posters every time. We called second base, frisbee throwing, all arm, and shortstop body throws. Lux tried to make body throws a lot at second base. I totally agree with that. Yep. I totally agree with that. That that is exactly right. That's right, because because a throw from shortstop so far. I think somebody there was a post one time showed the old Oakland where they had steel there. The the Oakland Raider when they had football stadium there, they had a football mm-hmm. field marked off on a baseball field. They showed it from deep shortstop to first. Was it 30, 30 foot, 35 yards, something like that? Yeah. Because you can tell by the length of the way the football field was marked how far that throw was from deep short. Uh, yeah, you got you got to have some power to come out and make that throw in shortstop. You know? Flip your hips, plant you, you know, drop step, put your back, you know, get your back foot set and get on, get it on something. Unless you're a jeter, you jump up in there and throw him out. But you know, he's he's the one in invented that throw. Coach, who you're looking at here is Alex Freeland, young man out of UCF. He was with Great Lakes last year, born with a club foot. So you got to love a guy that's able to overcome odds like that. A massive, massive amount of power. Nobody has more power than Coach. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you. Watch this home run here for Alex Friend. I just, I'm, let me, if I can get to it, let me, give me one second here. Okay, watch this home run right here, Coach. Wow. <laughs> watch where it hits. Doink, right off the scoreboard. Did you see that? Oh, yo, my. <laughs> That's shortstop. <laughs> this guy, to me, this is Alex Freeland. He is Corey Seager all over again. Right. If you ask Austin Gothier, who got to see him a lot with Great Lakes last year, he'll tell you he's super, super, super smooth at shortstop. So, you know, if you want to look at maybe a future middle infield, I think Gothier might might profile for second base where Freeland would be the shortstop if you had both of them in the lineup. We're also going to get to the young man here in a minute, Taylor Young, who is awesome too. But, Coach, this guy right here, just tell me what you see. Let me back you up and let, show you that swing. I'm going to show plenty of video of what do you see from that swing? Let me let me stop that and back it up and slow it down. Okay, so that's a lot of power. But watch his head. His head never moves, Coach. Never moves. To nope. be able to generate that much power and look, his head never moved. I mean, how strong do you have to be? That's He's the best good. of all worlds. You're generating power while seeing the ball. I mean, his eyes see the ball right now, right? Yeah. He's burying that chin. And he's throwing the back knee. He's got the back knee into it. Yeah, yeah. And and he's getting on top of it. Ball's up in his own a little bit. He just crushes it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll get to more here. Here's his first hit with Great Lakes. He's able to do that right there, too. So you saw the massive home run to right field. And then let me back that up. Watch him be a little bit fooled. You know, Coach, we talk all the time. Hitting isn't about being what you can do when you're perfect. Because, honestly, only about five times a year is a hitter's timing going to be perfect. The bat plane's perfect, and everything just goes perfect, right? That only happens about five times a year. So hitting isn't about being perfect. It's about what do you do when you're not perfect, 
when your bat angle is not perfect or your timing's not perfect. So watch him here. See how he's a little bit early on that? Yep. And look how he's able, because his head doesn't move, he keeps his hands back. He's able to get on plane with that pitch and it's flipping into left field. So he's able to hit the massive bombs when things go right, but then he's able to get fooled and flip it to left field. Just pop it out there. Yeah, that means he's not, he's not certainly not flying open. He's not, not throwing his hips out and flying up. We used to always say, hey, don't pull your head. Well, there's a reason why the head's going. It's because the body's going. You know, sure. The head don't go by itself. On that one, he's, he's right there. He keeps the hands back enough where he can still, as we call it, a little tennis serve out in the left field. There. This is, again, Alex Freeland that we're showing right here. Let's get to some more comments. Lexi looks great at shortstop, says Ela Shiva. Michael Hoffer says his throwing motion looks a little unorthodox. Yeah, I think that's what Coach Holt was alluding to was yep. because he sometimes when he knows he has time, he goes all the way back over to the top of his head. I think that's where the unorthodox looks. Would, would you think I'd be right there, Coach? I think so. You'll see some guys that, that throw, you know, drop down all the time. You know, and like I said, they get to the big leagues just because they, they've got it mastered or that's not a problem. But like I said, in high school, it just makes Coach Holt mad. They yeah. throw it over in the dugout over there because the ball's tails on them. But same way from the outfield. 2024, Roy says, 2024 needs to be Rojas mentoring Lux. Yeah, we went over that one. That, that is exactly right, Roy. That is 100% correct. Ila Shiva says, hope we use Lux and Mickey at Row at shortstop. Yep. Vargas, uh, we'll get to the, her comment, the, the comment about him here in a minute. Vargas is a natural third baseman. Why not play him there? Roy, you are preaching to the choir I think he's either a third baseman or a first baseman. I don't know that he's ever going to hit enough home runs for the Dodgers to want to put him at first base. But I, I totally – Coach, I, would you agree that I think sometimes putting a guy at a different defensive position can sometimes mess with their offense? It can be if, they, if that's something they've never played before, something they're very uncomfortable with. There's no doubt. You know, the baseball – This is Alex Freeland, by the way. This is not Miguel yeah. Vargas. I just want to make sure the fans knew that. Yeah. Just, you know, not telling anybody anything don't know there. I mean, if, if you're struggling defensively, yeah, it, it's more than likely going to affect your offense some because, uh, you know, if you can't feel – if you're having those issues, it's, it could affect your status on the ball club too, so. Here's some defense from Alex Freeland. Coach, tell me what you see here. Not bad? That's nice. Not bad at all. Back to his nice. right. That's Griffin Lockwood Powell, by the way. And then yep. here's an offensive play. So but let's play that one again and kind of take us through it and tell us what you see, Coach. Working back to his right a little bit. Yeah, you have to is, come is back he to fast right, enough? That'd be down. my only thing. Is he quick enough to the ball? It looks a little nah, – not, 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 not as good as you'd like to see. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if there's anything you might say, maybe some lateral quickness moving to his right a little bit quicker. Yeah, yeah. Gothier, yeah here's a comment from Grizz. Gothier seems to play – like he's Mighty Mouse. Yeah, no doubt about it. He definitely yep. is. So, here's Random Hero. So, for Locking and Lux at shortstop next year, and Rojas to back him up, does Vargas get the shot back at second base? What do you think, Coach? Vargas or Bush? Could. Second base. I, I'm ready for Bush to play, but that's just me speaking. Uh, Vargas probably has earned a shot at it, but I'm ready for Bush to take over. Yeah, that would be the question, is if, is if those two – let me get back to Bush here, Coach. Let me show you some from Bush here if I can get to it. All right, here is Michael Bush defensively at second base. So, actually, this is him in a shift moving to his right. He, remember, he was a quarterback, all-state quarterback. He was a hockey player. It, so, he only went to first base at North Carolina because North Carolina is awesome, and he wanted to get yep. on the field as a true as yep. a true freshman. So, let's answer that question. Here is Michael Bush at second base. What do you think moving to his right there? That looks good. I mean, the way he gets set up to make a throw, too, that was a tough play. Masha, I think this has some – some. there's some offense for him. But I like the fact that, that he hits the ball to all fields. So, there's Michael. But let me get to Miguel Vargas here, Coach. And I wanted to show you some – if I have some defense, I think. I want to show you some defense of him. And maybe we can kind of all get into a discussion. Let me get to my 2022 files. So, here's here's one right here for Miguel Vargas. All right, so kind of tell me what you see here at third base. So he gets up right there, and then the throw, that's, you know, it's a short hop. That's still a pretty good, that's still a pretty good play, in my opinion. That's why the first baseman earns his money. He's got to dig that out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a here, good play. Here's some more, here's some more Vargas in left field. Watch him track this one down. I think he could be a very, very good left fielder. I saw him do, you know, as a matter of fact, his first, 
his first game in left field, he went to his left and make a, made a diving play right in front of the bullpen. So I think he could be a very good left fielder. Here's that play again at third base. What do you think about the footwork? I like the foot. He had to because it spun him. He had to do a complete 360 before he made that throw, and he got a good position to make it. Hey, the, it's like Chris Taylor and all those guys that can play all these different positions. Kike, the guy, he can play left field. He can play, he can play out, you know, infield for you. You know, there's a lot of value in that. We even work that, you know, telling our high school kids that. If you want to play college ball, make yourself more marketable. Yeah. Play, play more than one position. If you're a shortstop uh, right now playing behind Ethan Holiday, good luck. You know, set him for the next two years. Watch his footwork starting a double play. Look at that. Look how he flips his hips. And what yep. I want you to notice is watch how he just flips his hips to get in position. Watch. So he flips a hip right there and yep. just perf. I, I just love the way he plays third base. Well, he he, he flips his hip and does a right throw right there. You can, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Plant the right foot, puts the left foot, and, and the ball's gone. So, okay, let's get to our well, next man. guy, coach. You're going to love this guy. He just got married. He is the all time hits leader at Louisiana Tech. If you remember, OSU was going to go play Louisiana Tech a couple years ago, and they, instead they went to Arizona. Do you remember that regional that OSU went to a couple years ago? Well, he was yes. the, the best player on that Louisiana Tech team. All time, If you talk to anybody from, from Bulldog country, I mean, he is just an all-time favorite there. Don't go by size. Don't go by any of that. Just watch the dude play. So this is Taylor Young. He is one of my favorite. Just got married, by the way, Coach, and to give a little story on him, he was a shortstop at Louisiana Tech, and when he proposed to his girlfriend, now his his wife, his wife Madison, he took them to the Love Shack. They call that that new stadium there at Louisiana Tech the Love Shack. He took her out to Love Shack beyond right field. There's a there's a train, and he said, "Hey, you know what? I just want to walk out to shortstop one more time with you." It was after they got beat by Texas in the regional, and as they did, the train actually came by as they were walking out to shortstop one last time, got out to shortstop and proposed to to his girlfriend, now wife, because he just got married at shortstop of the Love Shack, and he had just a tremendous year last year with the Great Lakes Loons. So tell me what you see right here from Taylor Young. It's a great thing about baseball. Size does not matter whatsoever. I mean, you go, you can go for years and years of baseball – so, what am I, I wasn't a Red Sox fan, but Dustin Pedroia, you know, look at Altuve. I'm certainly not an Astros fan, but, you know, those guys right there, have not big size, but have just been tremendous ball players. And they're, they're all over the game of baseball. This guy's got a lot of moxie, you can tell. Swings are back good. He plays good defense. And, uh, okay, I'm so for him, to his girlfriend on a baseball field, he's got to like that. Yeah, no doubt about it. Seven home runs last year, so it's not like he. He can't hit home runs. He had 55 RBIs. Coach, what you're going to like about him, though, 56 stolen bases. 56. And he stole base. He would steal third. Coach, he stole bases on delayed steals. He stole bases in every single which way. Walk percentage of 15%. Strikeout percentage of 20%. ISO of 117. So the ISO and K percentage is fairly close there. So you, you like that fact about it. He only hit 246. But that's because he got off to an unbelievably slow start. I mean, his first two or three months of the season, he just wasn't hitting anything. And then the last three months, he got really, really hot. So the fact that he actually ended up at 246 is very impressive. WRC plus of 115. So that's good. You like that. And then also, as we go down to some of the more advanced statistics, if I can get to them just here in a second, the batted ball statistics. But first of all, from what you see, as I get down to these batted ball statistics, Coach, just kind of analyze what you're seeing here a little bit more. Well, they're trying to get in on him right there, and he smoked it down the left field line. I mean, he's got quick hands uh, with his bat and good setup. Shows a lot of potential as a hitter. They throw him away, and he hit, hits it out of the ballpark. So, yeah, the thing, that's the thing about power, especially professional guys, it didn't come till later. You know, yeah. there, there are guys that's got power in, in college and whatever they come out, but – as they get older and stronger, then you know, and they learn how to handle the wooden bats. You know, you'll see more power come out of it. If they got potential to hit them, they'll, they'll hit them later on. Actually, surprises me, but his pull percentage is north of forty. Here's here's a, a bunt base hit, a stolen base, three hits for Taylor Young. He he pulls the ball forty four, forty three points. Uh, actually, this year it's forty four percent. Oppo thirty three percent though. So he doesn't use the middle of the field as much as Gothier does. He's more of a – he's either going to pull the ball. See how he stayed inside of that one? I like how he yep. stayed inside of that ball. He either pulls the ball or he goes the other way with it. 
there he's stealing a base. Without a throw, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so many times when you steal a base, you're stealing it off of the pitcher, right? And he does wow. just a great job of that. So when you ask who the next guy is, we've seen we've seen Austin Gothier, we've seen Taylor Young, we have seen we have seen Alex Freeland. Some of the other guys we're going to go down. I'm going to show you Wilman Diaz, coach, who is at the single A level. Wilman Diaz is a is a big guy that has a world of potential. I'm going to show you a home run of his. This is a shortstop guy right there. Look at that power to dead center. That's pretty good power. That's a pretty good poke. Yeah, 400 feet away. Yeah, this is a guy, Wilman Diaz, that that needs better bat to ball skills. I think he's going to have to prove better bat to ball skills at the lower levels. What you would love, what you love watching about Wilman, though, he has incredible, incredible infectious energy. Coach, when your shortstop is your most positive energy and positive body language guy, that goes a lot, a long ways for your team, doesn't it? Yeah, because he's got the guy in the middle there. It's like a quarterback, like your point guard in basketball. He's going to, he's going to bring a lot of energy to the team. That's one that the guys are going to look up to, no doubt about it. Yep. So, Wilman Diaz is another guy. And then the last guy that we're going to look at here is Rain Don Cone. If I can get to some oh, – up, I went. I clicked on the wrong file here. Let me get to Rain Don Cone here, Coach. They call him Donkey. Donkey is an absolutely – Huge young man. He was hurt last year, so please don't look at statistics for him. Their shoemaker, their coaching third base. This guy, as we roll through this, Donkey has has been one of the top rated uh, shortstop prospects in the game for a while. Again, the statistics did not look great last year. Do not look at that as I – let me try to get back to those. Rain Don Cone statistics last year, as this rolls up, we're going to look at a batting average of 215. So, again, he was hurt. This, you know, I talked to his his hitting coach, his hitting coach Dylan Ashotka, and this was the first thing he said about him: world of talent. Don't judge him on the stats. This, the, the, he was hurt most of last year, and we just tried to kind of get him back in the flow of things. And so, the batting average of two fifteen. Don't worry about that. No. Base on ball percentage of seven point six, strikeout percentage of twenty one point eight. So, what you see with a lot of these guys, Wilman Diaz and Rain Don Cone, there's a lot of swing and miss in their game. Yeah, that, that, and you can't judge a guy that just started his career, a young player, uh, just getting started, especially if he's fighting injuries. You know, it's a whole different world they're into all over, you know, with the wooden bats and all, and, you know, travel, uh, everything. So it, it's hard to judge a young player there that what's going to be the finished product. I don't think anybody's going to do that with him. Coach, look how easy this is. This is the home run. Look at that. That's big power, isn't it? I mean, that's a pretty easy swing to hit a home run with, right? It's like me hitting a phone go, except mine don't go that far. Here's another yeah, home run. Nice and easy. Just to kind of give you an example of just how much power. Look at that. I mean, mm -hmm. that's not – I mean, there's not a whole lot of effort going – let's watch his head. I mean, look at that head, right? I mean, yeah. let me back that up and see if I can get it right. See, let me look at his head right there, Coach. That head didn't move. And then watch how far that ball goes. It's already so, throwing I mean, a back knee right there. He, he's generated a lot of power right there. That back knee right yep. there. Yeah. Right see there, that? I see it. Yep. Yeah. That, he's not that's not flying open until he's got contact at the barrel in the zone for for a lot, quite a while, and it looks good. Yeah. So, you know, when they're young like this, coach, and of course the bat to ball skills typically come. The Dodgers have a lot of guys at the younger levels that don't have great bat to ball skills at this point. They try to develop those. What you look for are the the tools and the intangible tools that that you think translate to higher success. So when you see a guy that has this kind of easy power and that kind of frame, you have to get excited about a rain Don Cone type guy, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the sky's the limit for him. I mean, you know he's going to get bigger and stronger. Uh, he's going to start eating better. You know, at some point or another, there'll be some training staff getting involved with a nutritionist, getting him eating the right things and get him, you know, get him in the weight room, get him a, a training, maybe get his own trainer as well as a, as a doctor trainer. And, uh, you know, but same old thing, whether any sports you're talking about, there's the, there's the God-given stuff there that, you know, that's why he was drafted. He was drafted for, for a reason because he had that God-given ability. Now it's just refining it and, and you know, training him and, and making him a better athlete and a better a better baseball player. Yep. So there are your shortstop prospects. We talked about Gavin Lux at, at, at you know, pretty, pretty extensively. Austin Gothier, Taylor Young, Alex Freeland, Rain Don Cone, 
and also Wilman Diaz. So, Otani, coach, are the Dodgers going to get Otani? Let's back up to the hot stove talk. Uh, I hope so. Like I said, I just remember a couple of years or a year ago when they talked about him, what was coming down the pipe. If he's a pitcher, he's worth five hundred fifty million. If he's just a hitter, he's four hundred fifty. I know it's around five hundred million now. They're talking about. Uh, I'd hate. I'd really hate to see him go to the Giants just because they're in our division. But uh, and I really don't like the Giants that much. But uh, I would love for, for the Dodgers to get him. And I know that they, they got the money to do it, and they got the name and and the organization to, to get it done. And how if we get get him and Yamamoto both, like I said, let's play tomorrow. You know, I know they don't want to do that. But I'm, would, I'm Mr. Fanboy sitting here. Would Would he have enough clout, you think, to be able to tell the Dodgers that he needs a night off or to to not go with his part of the rotation for one round? You mean when, he, when he's pitching? That's yeah, like like yeah. if he thinks he needs to skip a round and say, hey, I don't want to pitch this time around. Skip me and put somebody else out there. Uh, I think you would. If you're paying five, uh, no, half a billion dollars for a guy, I think you got to let him let you know if he needs a, needs a break there. I don't, you know, I don't think he'd be a guy to take that too too many times. But yeah, I think he deserved that ride, especially because he plays every day. These other pitchers, you know, they don't play every day. They don't go through other things, and he probably does need that because he is an everyday player. Yeah, let's get to some more comments, Coach. You got a couple minutes to spend with us here. Yes, sir. Okay, let's get to some more comments. So, oops, I meant I viewed Vargas not being very good so far. Yeah, no, I think point blank, Coach, you know that I'm very positive with these guys, and I, I don't like to even speak of the negative because I know for a fact the Dodgers don't let you speak of the negative in the system because what they'll tell you is the negative thinkers don't make it. They just don't make it in professional baseball. So I don't even like to cover the negative because, you know, hey, they tell you what you do wrong, right, but they don't do it in a negative way. Does that make sense? So I don't like to go on the negative side of things, but I think it's fair to say that that Miguel Vargas, he he disappointed last year. He didn't he didn't play the way that a lot of us thought he would. As a matter of fact, Alex Friedman, the AAA play by play voice, said he was the best hitter that he'd ever seen come through Oklahoma City in twenty twenty what was it twenty twenty two. So is that fair to say that he was disappointing and did not live up to what we hoped he would be last year? I think it's fair, and you can just say he didn't reach his. Uh... I don't want to use the word potential again, but his expect his expectations. I think in the player will probably tell you the same thing. No, that's fair. I mean, that's I don't think. It, it, and as we all know, baseball is such a it's a it's a game of negatives. I mean, it's a negative game. You know, you're a great hitter if you hit you know thirty percent of the time. You're supposed to be a great hitter. There's no other sport in the world that that you're successful at thirty percent. So it, it's a game of failure. The ones that you know that, that, that handle it obviously this is not tell anybody but people don't know already the ones that handle the failure are the ones or the ones that succeed because it is a game of failure you're not you're just gonna have to deal with it you know if, if it eats you up it's not, it's not gonna last very long so i don't blame them they don't want people being negative talking uh, negative or whether it's coaches players or because the players get in their mind it doesn't take long to get into a uh, slump you can go four for four one night you come out and go oh, for four four k's the next day all of a sudden you talk yourself into slump so you know I'm, I'm all good with that. You know, maybe he didn't reach uh, the expectations they had of him. That's probably fair to say, though. This is Wilman Diaz here, Coach, the, another one of those young shortstops that went over a minute ago. We had a comment on him. He looks like a young Barry Larkin. Do you see that? Yep. Sure. Yeah. Similar, similar body and swing, yes. Coach, evaluate this swing. Tell me what you see here. It's funny. I like how he opens up an open stance. We just, it's funny. We were just working with some of our kids yesterday that opened, started the open stance and they were still closing their hips off. He didn't. He come back, got, got his feet squared up, uh, got, got loaded, got his, got his front foot down and stayed back, kept the hands. Like, you know, like everybody's teaching, so get inside the ball. I don't, I'm not a big uh, launch angle guy. I'm not a major league, whatever. Sure. I don't care about that. I don't like fly balls, you know, square it up and hit it hard. And he got a good swing. Yeah, no doubt. So, the bat-to-ball skills have not been very good for him, but do you see that getting better? I mean, just from what you see right there, is there the potential for the bat-to-ball skills to get better for this young man you just saw, Wilman Diaz? Oh, yeah, the fundamentals are, are pretty solid. I mean, you don't see, you know, again, on our level case, you see a lot of stuff. It, it, it seems like every day you're saying the same thing. You start working with kids, and they see them change it. But just looking at his swing there, it's uh, – you know, it'll get better. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Again, we're talking about a whole different thing from what these guys have. They're young players. They haven't been doing this that long, obviously. 
so they're they're still learning their craft too. And yeah, but he he's got he shows a lot of potential as a hitter. Let me get back to Freeland here, Coach, just for a second. If I can find the the right video here, right here, okay, and let me do this. This is Alex Freeland again. I've said a couple times maybe he gets moved to third base. What do you yeah. think? He looks he looks like a third baseman body the way his body feels the baseball the way through it. It's as like a third baseman. And mm-hmm. he has the power to be a third baseman. Just kind of looking yeah. at the way he comes through this ball. Imagine that being a swing and bunt and him coming in and throwing the first on a swing and bunt. Absolutely. That's what that looks like to me. Yep. He looks like a third baseman. You're right. I, I just so I think, you know, in the future, if let's say that Gavin I think it's a good situation because if if Gavin Lux is able to take this shortstop spot and and do what I think he's capable of doing and being being good at it for you know the the thing the reason why you need to root for Gavin Lux to be a good shortstop is that he's young, he's controllable for a while and he's fairly cheap for what you're going to get out of him and then he provides stability at one of the most important positions on the field. So Dodgers fans in my opinion really need to be rooting for Gavin Lux to take this shortstop thing by the bull by the horns because even if you go get a Trey Turner, we see we've saw it with him, then how long do you have him? Right? Absolutely. That's, yep. So so the stability is not necessarily there year in and year out. So the Dodgers fans in my opinion need to root for Gavin. Then you can build, you know, maybe your next third baseman is Miguel Vargas or or it's the Alex Freeland guy you just saw. Maybe you're, whoever, who knows who your second baseman is. Maybe that allows you to move an Austin Gothier or Taylor Young to second base. So there, if, if you start with the shortstop and you build around that, that really helps a club, in my opinion. No, you gotta have, you got to be stout there. You know, of course, I go back to 100 years ago. There used to be you know, all, all the teams, even major leagues on down, you want to be strong defense with the middle. Catcher, second base, shortstop, center, fielder. They didn't really care what their averages were. They were, they just want to be strong defense in the middle. That was the old old proverb of baseball. And then you had the Johnny Benches come along and that hit you know home runs. And you had the, the Alex Rodriguez and all these guys that started coming on changing. They didn't it didn't matter then. Now we we want hitters everywhere. I want everybody cranking the ball. You know we we need some offense in those middle guys too. But but the part about got to be strong defense in the middle it hasn't gone away. You know yeah. So I think you got to start there with the shortstop. Winter yeah, meetings last year. Excited. I'm sorry, Coach. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Go ahead and finish. I'm sorry. I just said, you know, the shortstop. I mean, that, that's that's such a big position that you you've just got to you got to have a solid short. And, and last year was exciting in one way that Lux was going to get that opportunity. Then when you saw him get hurt around the base of the spring training, that just now what do we do? You know, the season getting ready to start. And the Dodgers handle it pretty well. Worst case scenario. Mickey Rowe goes back to short. Gavin Lux goes back to second. You're still in pretty good shape, right? I think so. I think so. Yeah. So winter especially meetings are going. Especially if you have Otani hitting in there for a while. Yeah. And especially if you go get a Yamamoto, who's the number one starter. I, yeah, I we still got, we got Mookie, Mookie, Freddie, and Otani hitting right there. I, I kind of like that. I don't care who's pitching. Or Last who's year's pitching. winter meetings kind of came and went. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, goings on. Just kind of – it was a sleepy time. You know, Dodgers fans were – we're kind of disappointed in the fact that yep. that there wasn't a whole lot of big signings, and so when you're looking, you know, it, it looks like looking back on it that hey, the Dodgers, but you still thought you were going to have Dustin May healthy towards the end of last year. Thought you might have Walker Buehler at the end of last year. You didn't know Ta- Tony Gonsolin was going to get hurt. You thought you were going to have Gavin Lux. You didn't know that Noah Syndergaard was going to be a complete, you know, basically a flop. So you didn't know all that stuff at the beginning of it. This year is different. I think you do know that you have to go. You know, I think last year you could have looked back and said, hey, we already have guys for these positions, right? So we don't necessarily have to do anything. If we do, it's bonus. Whereas this year, you feel like you have to do something. I think there's a different mentality to it. At least that's how I look at it. Is that how you look at it, Coach? Yeah, well, I mean, look at the Texas Rangers last year. They go out and get one of the Hall of Fame manager who's sitting on his couch there in Nashville, Bruce Bochy. Again, I've never liked the Giants, but I always love Bruce Bochy as a manager, the way he handled himself and, you know, won a world title there three times with San Francisco. They go get him. They get these big names. The Rangers did set back. The Rangers went and did what they had to do to win now, and they won now. So there, there's always those ways of looking at those things. Uh, you know, 
but the Dodgers, like you said, didn't plan on losing their entire starting rotation and their starting shortstop. If you go tell anybody in the big leagues, oh, okay, you'll lose your whole rotation and your starting shortstop. Go go win your division. You know, it's not going to happen. So, uh, yeah. So I can, you can, as you look back, you can kind of see they they put a. It goes back to the same thing. They put a lot of stock in Lux. Yeah. They 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 were they were determined, not just determined. They they were sure he was their guy because they, they were they were going to go with it. And but then you lose your whole rotation. And everything everything looks differently. But so you know the best laid plans, as we say, no guarantees in life, and all all those things that go along with that. That was the second time they were sure Gavin Lux was their guy. I'm going to yeah. say it again, too. Coming out of 2019 and going into 2020, if the Dodgers would have turned it over to Gavin Lux at that time, I think Dodgers fans would have been super pumped about it because he was the number one prospect, shortstop prospect, coming out of minor leagues in 2019. And that stretch that he went on in Oklahoma City when he got to Oklahoma City that year in 2019, that was the year I was actually on – the grounds crew got to talk to him several different times and meet him. Matter of fact, I was about five feet away from whenever they actually made the call to him. It was down there, down the right field line, you know, where all the equipment room is down there yeah. behind, behind the right field at, at Bricktown Ballpark. You're seeing Gavin Lux here defensively. And I was there because after we do our all of our prep work for the field, then we kind of go just sit in that equipment room there behind right field and – and then so the, the, the breezeway goes right behind there that you, that you go to go to all the, the clubhouse, right, both sides. And so Gavin Lux came with all his suitcases, and they pulled up a, a big old vehicle, and he loaded all of his stuff up. And, and I saw about two or three hugs, and a couple of guys said, congratulations, Gavin, you're getting pulled up. And so I actually was about five feet away from the first time Gavin Lux got told that he was headed to the major league. So that was really cool. So obviously I'm probably – a little bit more emotionally attached to him than some people are. But also I saw with my own eyes in Oklahoma city that he was ridiculously good. Now that was a long time ago. He's played some second base then. So we'll see. We'll see. I think he's capable of it. I definitely yeah. think he's capable of it. But again, I'll say one more time. I think the beauty in it is that he has an awesome mentor in Miguel Rojas to work with him. He has an awesome mentor, Miguel Rojas that's going to be rooting for him and then also his insurance for him. So if he doesn't handle the job, then Rojas can slip over there. Then if you need to go get a shortstop at the trade deadline or whatever, you can go do that. So I think the Dodgers have set this up perfectly to where if Gavin Lux ever is going to have success as a shortstop for the Dodgers, this would be the way that it would happen. Yeah, I think they've got it set up. Like I said, we, we just got to go back and remember they were totally sold on him last year. Yes. They made no moves whatsoever. They they knew this was our guy. So you know, I get, these guys are a lot smarter than I am. They see these guys every day, and they're major league executives and coaches and managers. So they they know what they're talking about. I'll be shocked if he doesn't have success at shortstop. You know, the bat may you never know. He goes back to Santa. You know, he may not hit for a whole bunch when he starts. Who knows? He may come out and, and wear it out like Altman did this year. You know, at the start, you know, yeah. people figure him out, but. They want the defense. He'll bring the defense every day. He won't forget how to play shortstop as long as his knee's healthy. Bets may complicate things because he wants to play more second base. I don't blame him either. I I, I love Mookie Betts at second base, Coach. I, I love that idea. I think Mookie Betts is a dog. I think he gets bored in right field. I think that actually affects his play. I think he wants – there are times, not all the time, but I think there are times to where – his dog brain, when I say dog, I mean D-A-W-G, like he's a dog, you know. I think that part of his mentality wants to be closer to the action sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure he does get bored out there. He seems like his personality is only be in the middle of things. Heck, put him a shortstop then if we have trouble out there. Yeah. Okay. The he, other two things don't work. He would play it. I guarantee sure he, he would play it. He'd probably play it well. I mean, he could probably handle it, no doubt about it. But that'd be great, as we've talked about before, as long as you get us a good right fielder. And I know they signed Hayward again. And he's, he's still good out there in right field. I know that they re-signed him. We've talked about that some, too. They've got Hayward coming back. So, that, as, there's your insurance policy for, for a right fielder. Not going to bring the offensive numbers that Mookie has, but mm -hmm. he, he's still a seasoned, outstanding major league player for a long time. So I like the Hayward signing as long as you plan on using him as a fourth outfielder and only in positions to where it sets up perfectly for him to succeed. Matchups that set up for him perfectly. I love him in that role. 
I don't, I don't, if, if you plan on him being one of your starting three out, we're going to go till 830 guys. So you got till 830 coach. We good sure. till then. Yeah. Yep. So I don't like him necessarily if you brought him back to be one of your three starters, but I do like it. I think he's perfect if you bring him back as a fourth outfielder and a guy that you play in perfect type, type matchups. Let's go get, let's go get Joey Gallo. The reason I say that he was here last week yep. hitting with Matt, Matt Holiday out of his hitting facility, his house. Uh, you know, Matt's a hitting consultant for the Scott Boral Skies, and mm-hmm. Joey Gallo was in town, and Ethan was telling me, man, he's big, and Ethan's about 6'5 himself. Yeah. And I was talking to him, and, and he's hitting with Matt, and we know how Matt Holiday did with Matt Carpenter a few years ago. Yeah. Kind of, kind of fixed him. and I Cody Bellinger. The Bellinger was here last year. So maybe the, now that Gallo came and hit with Matt Holiday, uh, maybe, hey, let's get him back because Gallo was a good defensive outfielder. Big guy, but he's a good defensive outfielder and had tremendous power. His deal was kind of, you know, kind of along the lines of Muncie, a lot of strikeouts and that sort of thing. So, who knows? Maybe Matt Holiday fixed him and go ahead and sign that rascal because he's sure an impressive looking baseball player. But no, Hayward's good, good to have because because he can play, you know, all the outfield positions and and, he, and he's and he's still very very useful. He, he's not, you know, he's not washed up by any stretch. Yeah, no doubt. What do you think about Max Muncie at second base? Did you like that? Uh, not really. I, that's just an old, old coach, I, and that's not something I enjoyed. But you know, he, he's it. There's no doubt he's in there for his offense. You know, if you can get him to play anywhere, he's he's an all, he's an offensive player. And, you know, it'd be great if he could play the outfield, but but he's more of a second base, third base, and he's played some first too. So, you know, he's he's a, a very good offensive player. But yeah, I'm not crazy about that. No. Yeah. So where do you like his defensive position? There is Max Muncy at third base, right there. So you like him at third base better? Yeah, and if you choose between the two, yes. Yeah. Between second and third, I'd say third. That drives me nuts, Coach. Can you see that tag right there? Yep. That absolutely drives me insane. I hate it when guys catch the ball and reach for the runner. If yeah. he just catches the ball right here and just drops his glove in front of the bag. In the bag, he's out. He's out. I mean, it's not even close. Yep. Instead, look, watch how he reaches out. And now because he reaches out, instead of hitting him on the bottom of the foot, He's hitting him on the knee or the shin, yep. and he's safe. safe. I hate that. I always say, just always tell it, young players, put it in front of the bag. Where's he going? Where's his foot going? He's got to get to the bag, right? He's got to get to the bag or he's out. So. There's Muncie at second base, yeah. And that was back – I think that's actually when he's playing third base but in a shift. But I can tell you this, Muncie, when he came to Oklahoma City, when the, when the Dodgers picked him up from Oakland, he was literally the worst defensive player I think I've ever seen at the AAA level. And I was like, Dan, this dude's never going to be able to play defense at the major yeah. league level. And, man, did the Dodgers credit. They have made him a serviceable defensive player to be at least good enough defensively to where you can put him out there to get his bat in the lineup. So I give yeah. the Dodgers a lot of credit for Max Muncy because they, they've really gone to work with his defense. Like I said, he's played some first down before we get, before the Freddie days came along. and He played some first – few years ago not very often but he, yeah. he he can do that also so no they've done a great job a, a, a guy they re-signed him they're pretty much sold on him too you know he brings good power and you know has a few few more strikeouts to get a lot but that's his game and, the, and they know what they're getting it's not like hey we're going to get him and you know maybe quit striking out so much they know what they're getting they're getting power and, and a run producer you just got to live with the strikeouts which is the nature of the modern baseball and you know whatever the old guys like me doesn't matter what we think i think deuce hits it here muncie was okay at second when the shift was legal but when they eliminated the shift now you have to go both ways and have more range Mm -hmm. i think that eliminated defensive players like muncie in positions where you have to cover a lot of territory yeah i mean you can still play some third do some dh and 40 that type of stuff but uh yeah i i never was crazy about that second base i mean we got a lot of guys who can play second base. But yep. like I said, we there's no secret he's their first bat. I think Grizz has got is onto something here. We need to watch how Muncie starts hitting left left handers. Starting to yep. struggle against lefties. So we'll see how that goes for him. If he becomes a guy that's below average defensively and it can only hit right handers, that becomes pretty limiting as far as what the club can do with him. So I think we'll keep an eye on that. Let me ask you this before we get out of here. We have about Five more minutes in this show if you have any more questions. I want to remind you guys, too, at the top of the chat, we have our GoFundMe account. Trying to set up an account there to send us all to spring training. So if you want to donate $0.05, cents, $0.10, cents, $0.50, cents, $1, $5, if you'd like, no big deal either way. Dodgers Daily will always be free. So 
No worries about that. Coach, do you like the fact that the Dodgers are trying to create so much versatility with their players, or do you wish they would just put a guy in one position and let him master that one position? I like the versatility. Like I said, you go back to we got Chris Taylor, uh, Kike Hernandez, those guys that can play multiple positions for you. I mean, let, let, let's be honest. We, we have one of the best first basemen in, in baseball, you know, and that, that's the only position he's going to play. You know, Mookie, Mookie can go, you know, outfield or infield. Mookie can play anywhere. He'd probably catch, probably pitch too. I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, he can do anything. But, you know, I, 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 I love it. I love it if they're making guys more versatile they can do. Well, I mean, thank God that, that Muncie can play somewhere. In the yeah. He sure couldn't play in the outfield. He wouldn't be serviceable at all if you didn't make something out of him there. So uh, they, they, they've got to have those guys, I think, on any level. Uh, to me, it just makes more sense because you know and I know when you're filling out lineup cards, you want your best nine people on the field. Best nine hitters. Best nine hitters on yes. the field. You, you got to have your best nine hitters. Like I used to tell players all the time, I only need one DH. I only have one DH. I can't DH all of you. you yeah. You, you got to bring something to us where we can, you know, maybe your, your best position is third base, but I've got another guy who can play third, and I can put you in right field. It yeah. makes our ball club better. It's not it's not your best position, but it makes our ball club makes better. I mean, we, we've done that on high school level. You've done it at Guthrie High School. We've all done that on that level. Try to get your best nine hitters on the field. And, and uh, like I said, I, I, I guy you know, John Lattell, played. He was always an outfielder. Played for me in the outfield at Stillwater High and at Oklahoma State. But one year I asked him to play shortstop. Oh, really? He wasn't, he wasn't a shortstop. Boy. Yeah, his junior year, we we uh, Ryder Jones had moved. Uh, he was a second round draft pick for yeah. the Giants. Was I saw shortstop. Ryder with the Giants a couple years ago when he came. Through. Yeah, yeah, he had a home run down there. I think yeah. I probably hit that game. But anyway, yeah. uh, so we we did literally did not have a shortstop at the time, and I think called Johnny. And I said, "No, you're not a shortstop. I know you're not going to play short." But he was a good athlete, big rangy kid. You know, he wasn't a great shortstop, but he was a good he, he was a good player, good athlete. So. He played shortstop. I mean, I think in the net, very next year we moved him to left field, back, back to left field, and that's where he played with Oklahoma State. But you know, so you got to do what you got to do. That made us a better team. You know, I mean, we I had a guy who could play left field, but I had anybody who play shortstop. So I moved John in, and, and and being a great kid like he is, he took it. But that's just an example of what you do when you when you're putting your lineups together. You know, and of course now with all the analytics, you got you know you got a guy that you know can't hit lefties or he can't. This guy's a sinker baller. He can't hit him. You know, then you got to make decisions off that. So they, to me, in the big league level, they're going to have way more versatility because because all their analytics stuff tell them yeah. this guy can't play because this because this guy's pitching. That makes you know, sense. This, you know, I can't I can't hit you today. We're even going to do this summit with our, our high school. I've talked to Coach Lee's about that. Well, well, that's some guys we know, and you've done it. Good breaking ball hitters. Uh, if they're bad breaking ball, here's this guy's a, it's a thumber. You know, I can't play today. Yeah. Now, that being said, we we have a good enough player to put in there instead of him. Yes. If you only got nine that can play, you just got to wear it. Yeah, right. And then on the big league level, they're not going to do that. So uh, the, yeah. they're going to be able to make those decisions right there. That's why you, you got to have so much. I know those analytics are big now for those guys, and you got to have all that stuff. You know, you got you, you got to have kids. Okay, you can't hit today because you hit 110 against a guy. Right. You know, Guy throws a cutter. And this guy's a cutter guy. You, you're not playing today. You know, that's just because I can't play. You know, so you need to have something going there. So, right. Yeah, versatility is it, it, to me. I don't know. I'm just just an outsider looking in. Do you lose any more. expertise because you're not at one spot every day, though? Yes, I know mean, you'd have to. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, if that's you know. Well, we want to pound ground balls at you. We got every coach in Stillwater gear up there pounding ground balls right, right there. Marty leads to walk around working with them. You know, if you're also doing that, but we got to get some work in the outfield or get some work behind the play with the catchers. Yeah, yeah, you're going to lose, you're going to lose some some reps. You're going you you won't be near as good if you're not just concentrating on one position. You know, I, I got you there. You know, if you're if you're nothing but a middle infielder, I can drill work with you every day. You're just going to get better and better and better. But if we're going to have to use you behind the plate or on the mound or on the outfield, of course, they don't do that at big league level. But, yeah, you know, you're, going to, you're going to lose a little bit there because you're going to miss out on reps. Yep. doesn't mean you're bad. just mean you maybe you're not as good as you would be. Yeah, no doubt. You ought to be better if you're one position. Right. Defensively, but you think the versatility. Can, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, versatility. Yeah. Obviously, you'd be all better that. if all you did every day was – was play one position every day. You walked out. That's what you did. Obviously, you'd be better defensively there, but you know. Also, I walk out and I go, "You, you, you hit one twenty on this guy." 
Yeah. So you're not playing today. So I got to have somebody else do it. So, yeah, I think to me, looking from that angle, the versatility has got to be more important. Yeah. Than, than it used to be, probably. Yeah. Charlie Dodger says it seems like they just can't decide what to do with second base. I think coming into last year, they 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 felt like it was going to be Lux at short and Vargas at second, with Miggy Rowe being the insurance for both of those guys. And I I think they they were very comfortable with that. And then all of a sudden, Lux tears his ACL. Vargas doesn't pan out like they wanted to. Now you're kind of back to square one, you know. So yeah. I think they did have the plan for that. It just you had an injury and then a guy that just didn't quite live up to what you wanted to. So I. I think that put a, a kink into what they were planning on doing as far as the future of those. Because you're talking about two very dynamic players. If Vargas, you know, if he went up and played the way that, that the Dodgers people thought he was going to, and then Lux played like they thought he that that's a middle infield that's very dynamic and that you have a lot of control over that's fairly cheap for the production you're getting for a long time. Then you can start building the Shohei Otanis around those guys. It's- I'll go back and say what I said before. And I don't have a vote, and nobody cares what my opinion is. I'm just a little high school guy here in Stillwater. But Dave, think about what Roberts and the staff was able to accomplish. What you just said right there. You lose your starting shortstop during spring training. Yes. Season, what, a couple of weeks away, whatever it was. I remember exactly when it was. Lose your entire rotation. That's what I mean. That changes everything. When you lose a rotation, it changes your – just like when if I got to use eight pitchers a day, Case, it's going to affect me the next day, the next day, and the next day because – now I have guys that are available and some that aren't available, you know, so it, it, it's a, it's a domino effect on everything you do, you know, and, you know, like I say, when Lux went down, it changed everything. Hey, we got a, we did. got a fix for the second base. So me and you're all in on this, get us a great right fielder and Mookie's our guy. Mookie's at second, let's roll. You like that idea? I got to get some good out. I want a good right fielder. Maybe that's Joey Gallo. Maybe Matt Holiday fixed him. Maybe he's, he, and of course, he hit the ball a mile. He's good defensively, so we already know that. Maybe he fixed it. <laughs> Sell the know. farm, go but, get Randy or Rosarina and put him in right field. I, I know he I played did. left field last year, but you could put Johnny DeLuca in right and put put a Rosarina in left and then move Mookie to second. Now, I saw that on the, on social media. So, is, is, is that a thing or is that something? Is that Probably the Dallas not. Cowboy thing? Hey, the Cowboys may be looking at Aaron Rodgers. Shut up. No, you're not. That's I will say thing. this. If the Dodgers actually wanted a Rose Arena, I think they could put a package together to to at least get the talks going because they have they have firepower codes. The Dodgers have firepower. They got it. Prospect you got right, they do. They got it. I mean, they got the money. They got the power. They got the name. They got – uh, you got the logo, you got everything they need for that. I, I, I'm all in on that. Yeah. Psycho like deals, you know, everybody hated Dennis Rodman until he's on your team. Yeah, right. He does all the dirty work. He don't score. He gets 20 rebounds a game and plays defense, takes charges. He, you hate him until he's on your team. You know, yeah. it's kind of Randy Rosarina. You know, he, he's kind of a cocky guy, but, you know, if he's playing that Dodger Blue, baby, he's my hero. You know, I saw him in OKC in 2019. He wasn't playing for Oklahoma City. He's playing against him. And it was in August and it was 180 degrees. And he went like, in four games or the five games I saw him, he went like twenty seven for thirty <laughs> and was smiling the whole time and have and I'm like, dude, it's like hundred and eighty degrees and like everybody else is like just miserable and it's been over a hundred for like two months in a row. And he's just having a hell of a good I was like, I like that dude. And I, I remembered his name because of that. So I would hey, whatever you need, I would I would be all in for that. I love I, that say, guy. Absolutely. We'd love him. You know, us OSU fans always hated Baker Mayfield. Oh, yeah. We'd have loved him if he'd been our quarterback. I would have loved <laughs> it even more if they yeah. would have allowed that interception for pick the pick six to, to stand like it should have whenever he oh, came yeah. to Stillwater and played. Yeah, yeah that's, right. that's right. Okay, Coach, that's all we got for all tonight. Right, so, hey, I certainly appreciate you 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 coming on and, and talking some Gavin Lux. I hope you enjoyed watching some of the young shortstop appreciate prospects. We're going to yeah. get a lot more of that going as we go on, your, your opinion of that and just breaking it down, it's just it's just invaluable for Dodgers Daily. It's just absolutely incredible. We had a wonderful crowd, Coach. We had over 40 people in the lobby, yeah. and it's just absolutely growing. So I want to thank everybody. I know I got kind of fired up last time like, like I tend to do sometimes because I love my Dodgers and I love baseball. You know how that goes. So I, I'm glad everybody came back and we had a great show tonight. So I want to thank everybody for, for showing up and, and tuning in and giving your opinions. It was a great show, so thank you for tuning in. And I'd like to say one last time, go Dodgers. Get Shohei, get Yamamoto, get a Rosarina, get Burns, get them all. Let's go, baby. Get them all. Let's go.